Our next topic is the neuromuscular junction. We'll do a quick review of normal physiology of the neuromuscular junction, and then we'll talk about common conditions that affect the neuromuscular junction. So recall that at a normal neuromuscular junction, we have an action potential traveling down the nerve, and that this stimulates these voltage-gated calcium channels. And the entry of calcium is the key event um, here for normal release of acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction. And so we have these um, synaptic vesicles here that contain acetylcholine, and it is the influx of calcium that stimulates these uh, vesicles via snare proteins, and I'll show you a more detailed picture in just a minute, um, that facilitate the vesicles binding with the presynaptic membrane and then releasing acetylcholine. So these cross the neuromuscular junction where they stimulate nicotinic receptors. So this causes um, an action potential and muscle fiber um, depolarization. Now down here in the synaptic clefts, we have most of our acetylcholinesterase, which breaks down acetylcholine and um, as I'll show you, then choline gets taken back up into the uh, presynaptic terminal and is made back into acetylcholine. And so um, acetylcholine is really unique compared to other neurotransmitters, although we mentioned other enzymes that are involved in breaking down neurotransmitters. Most um, neurotransmitters are inactivated mainly by reuptake. So whether we're talking about dopamine or GABA um, or whatever, um, the main in inactivation is through reuptake. So the presynaptic terminal is just like a sponge and it sucks the neurotransmitter back up. Um, but for acetylcholine, it's mainly inactivated by the enzyme. And so that's why when we talk about medications, for example, that act against acetylcholinesterase, that has a very profound effect on acetylcholine. All right, so here we have um, these acetylcholine vesicles, which normally are kind of uh, bound up here, tied together. But when we have an influx of calcium here, um, this ends up facilitating these vesicles uh, to bind here with the presynaptic membrane. And so this occurs through these snare proteins. So we can see that in the synaptic vesicle, we have synaptotagmin and synaptobrevin. And so when calcium binds to synaptotagmin, that stimulates synaptobrevin to bind with the SNAP25 and syntaxin that are in the presynaptic membrane. And then when that happens, acetylcholine is released. All right, so uh, actually just come back to this uh, drawing here. So there are three main neuromuscular junction disorders. Um, two are presynaptic. So if we have antibodies, against voltage-gated calcium channels, that's Lambert-Eaton syndrome, and we don't release enough acetylcholine. If we have a problem here with the snare proteins, um, and that is disrupted by botulism, then again, we don't have release of acetylcholine. Uh, myasthenia gravis, on the other hand, is a postsynaptic problem where we have antibodies against the nicotinic receptors. Okay, so release of acetylcholine then is going to be normal um, in myasthenia gravis. So myasthenia gravis, um, you're only allowed to have weakness in myasthenia gravis because the problem is with nicotinic receptors on muscle. So the autonomic nervous system is not involved in myasthenia gravis. And so most often patients present with ocular manifestations, usually ptosis or double vision. Um, but again, because the pupil, which... Uh, we'll get into later, but the pupil size depends on the sympathetic system um, and the parasympathetic uh, system to either dilate or constrict the pupil. And that has nothing to do with nicotinic receptors. So the pupil will be normal. You may have very significant eye movement problems and uh, ptosis. You might be thinking it's a third nerve palsy or something like that. Uh, but in my scene, an uninvolved pupil. Um, next involved are uh, bulbar musculature, so dysarthria, dysphagia are very common, and then finally have weakness in the extremities. And so um, a key feature of myasthenia gravis is that we don't just have weakness in these areas, but it's fatiguing weakness. 
And so when we're examining a patient with myasthenia, for example, we're checking the eyes, we want to try to fatigue the neuromuscular junction. So we'll have the patient look up at the ceiling for a couple of minutes, and then we can see what's called the curtain sign, where you fatigue the neuromuscular junction, important for eyelid elevation, and the eye drops down. Uh, or we may have the patient look back and forth, back and forth, and then finally you notice one eye is not working very well. Um, with bulbar musculature, if we just listen to the patient talk for a while, their speech may become slurred um, over time as you fatigue that neuromuscular junction, or the patient may complain that um, prolonged chewing of food, that their jaw muscles just kind of wear out. And in, when we're checking extremity uh, weakness in myasthenia, it may appear normal initially, but as you just continue to give more effort against a muscle, you notice it becomes weaker. So all of that illustrates uh, the fatiguing weakness. And so patients with myasthenia will usually notice that uh, weakness comes on uh, at the end of the day, when they're more tired, or when they've been um, exerting themselves. All right, so there is... Um, patient comes in looking like this, myasthenia would come um, up high on the list. So again, not involved, parasympathetics, pupil is going to be normal. All right, so how do we diagnose myasthenia? Well, um, we don't do this as much anymore, but certainly boards will ask you about the tensilon test or edrophonium, where you give intravenous um, edrophonium, which is a very potent inhibitor of acetylcholinesterase, so we have a lot more acetylcholine than available for a few minutes at the neuromuscular junction. And so there are nicotinic receptors just sort of hanging around at the neuromuscular junction that are not bound um, by these nicotinic receptors. So we stimulate all of those, and the patient has a brief improvement in the objective findings that you're seeing, whether it's ptosis or weakness. Um, EMG. Uh, normally, if you repetitively stimulate a nerve and you record over the muscle, there's no change. But in myasthenia gravis, we get this decremental response. And this is sort of the electrical representation of the fatiguing weakness. So if you see that, you know we're looking at myasthenia gravis. Um, a simple bedside test is called the ice pack test, where you just put ice over the eye if they have ptosis for um, a minute or two. And um, when uh, things cool down, that actually inhibits acetylcholinesterase a little bit. So you take the ice pack off, and all of a sudden the eye is elevated back to normal for a period of time. And then myasthenia, we have a great uh, antibody test here, acetylcholine receptor antibody, which is positive in more than 85% of patients that have generalized myasthenia. If someone just has purely ocular myasthenia, so it only involves the eyes. Um, this test is only about 50% positive. All right. Um, there are some other antibodies that we can test, but I think um, for boards, uh, this is what you need to know about diagnosis. Um, we always do a chest CT when we diagnose myasthenia gravis. So only 5 to 10% of patients have a thymoma, but we always need to look for that. And in terms of treatment, um, you can remove the thymus gland. We generally do that in younger individuals because the pathophysiology of myasthenia does involve um, abnormalities in the thymus gland, um, or certainly if you find a thymoma. But in terms of medications, pyridostigmine is the medication that we start with in myasthenia gravis. So this is um, an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor, just like edrophonium, but it's long-acting. It's an oral medication. And so... We have more acetylcholine available at neuromuscular junctions, and so in terms of side effects, excessive nicotinic stimulation can result in fasciculations. So the patient might complain of an eyelid twitch. It's usually not a, a significant deal. But if we have too much acetylcholine involving the parasympathetic system, and this will make more sense uh, here in just a minute or two, then we overstimulate um, vagus nerve um, stimulation of the GI tracts, we get stomach cramps, and diarrhea. This would be our most common side effects. All right, next we have botulism, which, recall, is a problem with presynaptic release of acetylcholine. And so if we don't um, release enough acetylcholine, we understimulate nicotinic receptors, and so there's weakness, just like we see in myasthenia, but in botulism, 
this comes on um, acutely over hours. So patients are in the emergency room. And classically, botulism results in a descending paralysis. So it starts with the eyes and then moves down to the bulbar, talking, swallowing muscles, and then to the extremities. And so botulism can either be um, uh, through wounds. And so um, in, in this area in Southern California, we see a fair amount of botulism from people who inject heroin, uh, heroin from Mexico that's called black tar heroin. Uh, but this can also be through ingestion. So if you get a story of a whole family coming to the emergency room after eating a meal, um, that's probably botulism. So improperly canned foods. Infants occasionally can get uh, botulism from ingestion of honey uh, due to the immature um, GI tract. Okay, so a key difference with botulism, other than just that it comes on acutely, um, is that if we don't release acetylcholine, then we're also going to under-stimulate muscarinic receptors, which are activated by acetylcholine. And so the two most common uh, deficits we would see there are constipation, so under-stimulation of the GI tract, and then the pupil, which remember is a balance between the sympathetic system, which dilates the pupil, and the parasympathetic system, which constricts the pupil via muscarinic receptors. So if you are understimulating those muscarinic receptors, the sympathetic system is relatively overactive and the pupils dilate. So here's a patient with uh, botulism. We can see the significant ptosis. And when we lift up the eyelids, look at the big pupils. Okay, so mydriasis here is a classic feature of botulism. Now I'll just mention parenthetically, and we'll come back to this uh, later on, that uh, another condition here that does affect these snare proteins is tetanus. But in tetanus, the problem is here with cleaving synaptobrevin. And uh, so this mechanism here with snare proteins is involved in release of other neurotransmitters. And so for tetanus, when you block um, or cleave the synaptobrevin, you don't release glycine in spinal cord pathways and GABA in the brainstem. And so these are both inhibitory neurotransmitters, and that's why uh, when this happens in the spinal cord, we get the excessive uh, muscle tone and activation because you're losing these inhibitory neurotransmitters. So this is not really a neuromuscular junction disorder, but it just sort of fit um, to mention that here since we've talked about the mechanism of snare proteins. Lambert-Eaton syndrome, sometimes called myasthenic syndrome, is again, like botulism, a problem with release of acetylcholine, but this comes on uh, very slowly, um, unlike uh, botulism, which comes on acutely. So this is a perineoplastic syndrome, meaning it's a secondary effect of cancer. Usually the symptoms of Lambert-Eaton syndrome come on before the patient is known to have cancer. And so this is usually small cell lung cancer, and so a vignette for Lambert-Eaton syndrome would generally involve a patient with a long history of smoking who's now coming down with weakness. Okay, so the mechanism is um, there is antigenic similarity between small cell lung cancer and the voltage-gated calcium channels. So we have antibodies against voltage-gated calcium channels. And so we don't release acetylcholine, you don't stimulate nicotinic receptors, and so patients have progressive weakness. And in Lambert-Eaton syndrome, it tends to almost always start in the legs. Now, they can have some ocular and bulbar neuromuscular junction um, weakness, but uh, usually presents with leg weakness and falling. So again, think of a smoker coming in with leg weakness. And um, it does tend to fatigue, just like myasthenia gravis. Now, if we don't release acetylcholine, then just like botulism, you understimulate the parasympathetic system. And so the, the two areas that tend to be most affected in Lambert-Eaton syndrome are the salivary glands and the GI tract. So dry mouth and constipation are rather prominent features in Lambert-Eaton syndrome. So Lambert-Eaton syndrome has a very unique exam finding. Uh, first of all, even though this is not a lower motor neuron disorder, so this can be a bit confusing, but um, if you have blocked voltage-gated calcium channels, then um, th that 
influx of calcium is really necessary to facilitate reflexes on examination. So reflexes tend to be absent. They tend to have proximal leg weakness. So you might be thinking, well, maybe this is a lower motor neuron condition because of the absent reflexes. <clears throat> but um, here's the unique finding that you really only see in Lambert-Eaton syndrome. If you ask patients to briefly activate muscles, so you know maybe you're not getting a patellar reflex, but then you have them um, straighten the leg out to activate the quadriceps, and then you go back and you check that patellar reflex, um, it returns, comes back to normal. And so what happens is brief muscle activation can cause a brief stimulation of the voltage-gated calcium channels. And so we get a little more influx of calcium, and then the reflexes may return. And they may even have a transient increase in strength after you do that. All right, so that finding, again, is uh, unique and specific for Lambert-Eaton syndrome. <clears throat> All right, so like Mycenae gravis, we have a great antibody test for Lambert-Eaton syndrome. <clears throat> Excuse me, you can check the antibodies against the voltage-gated calcium channel. And this is very sensitive, very specific, okay? And uh, really with any presynaptic problem, if we repetitively stimulate um, nerves on EMG, we get an incremental response. Okay, so I think you're most likely going to be asked about myasthenia with a decremental response, but we can see an incremental response with Lambert-Eaton syndrome and botulism. <clears throat> so a medication um, that is used for Lambert-Eaton syndrome is 3,4-diaminopyridine. And let me just show you the picture of this here. So here we have a normal neuromuscular junction, all right, so an action potential indicated by this uh, little red um, electrical signal here. So we get influx of calcium, there's efflux of potassium, and normal release of acetylcholine. Now in Lambert-Eaton syndrome we have antibodies here against the voltage-gated calcium channels. So the action potential comes down, but um, again we're not getting as much influx of calcium, and so we have less release of acetylcholine. And so this medication, 3,4-diaminopyridine, it blocks the efflux of potassium um, here. And so the effect that that has is that the, the action potential duration is actually longer. So we um, are able to overcome somewhat the uh, blockage of voltage-gated calcium channels by the antibodies here. And so you can see it's not the same release of acetylcholine as normal, <clears throat> but we have more release of acetylcholine um, when we give 3,4-diaminopyridine. Therefore, a patient is going to be stronger and um, hopefully clinically able to walk better and so on. <clears throat> now, this is a good time to review a little bit some of the anatomy of the autonomic nervous system. So we've been talking about the neuromuscular junction. And so remember here that we, when we have nerves... Uh, either the uh, neurons, either anterior horn cells in the spinal cord or cranial nerves that talk directly to muscle. Movement is facilitated by release of acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction and then stimulation of nicotinic receptors on muscle. And we call these the N1 receptors because there are two different types of nicotinic receptors. So these are, this is the somatic motor system, okay, involving neuromuscular junctions. Now, the parasympathetic system we call craniosacral because there are cranial nerves that are part of the parasympathetic system and also sacral neurons down here. And so we can see that cranial nerves 3, 7, 9, and 10 have a parasympathetic um, contribution. So the third nerve here, parasympathetic fibers with the third nerve, go out via the ciliary ganglion to constrict the pupil. And so this would involve here acetylcholine at these nicotinic 2 receptors, in this case the ciliary ganglion, and then uh, remember the parasympathetics on uh, end, end organs, it's always acetylcholine on muscarinic receptors. All right, so notice that myasthenia has nothing to do with this. These are muscarinic receptors, and even these nicotinic receptors here at the ganglion uh, we call them N2. They're morphologically different nicotinic receptors, so they are not involved in myasthenia gravis.
Okay, so we have cranial nerve 7 and 9 here stimulating the um, salivary glands. Um, and here's the vagus nerve, okay, which has uh, obviously an effect on the heart, the lungs, the GI tract. And then finally, we have the sacral here, which is going to act on the uh, bladder uh, and uh, rectum. Okay, and so um, in terms of the parasympathetics, um, in conditions where we don't release acetylcholine, like Lambert-Eaton syndrome and botulism, they will be affected. So that's why the pupil is affected, like in botulism. The salivary glands are affected, um, especially in Lambert-Eaton syndrome. The uh, vagus nerve um, is going to be affected in uh, both Lambert-Eaton syndrome and botulism, so constipation is quite uh, profound. Okay, and, you know, medications like atropine, which block um, acetylcholine on muscarinic receptors, or tricyclic antidepressants, which is one of several groups of medications which have um, anti-muscarinic, anticholinergic um, effects. So all of those could affect... Um, you know, this uh, anatomy. A little bit on the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus. When we go through the brainstem, um, we'll come back to this. So this is the parasympathetic contribution to the vagus nerve. And so I just showed you how this supplies the lungs, heart, GI tract. And I just wanted to mention here that um, the parasympathetic, the acetylcholine on muscarinic receptors in the heart, slows the heart. And so just consider when we give someone edrophonium, um, to diagnose myasthenia gravis. Well, you're going to have more acetylcholine um, stimulating muscarinic receptors on the heart. So this could slow the heart rate down. And so we do need to do cardiac monitoring when we do an edrophonium test, and we need to have atropine available because atropine blocks um, acetylcholine. Okay, now there are afferents that uh, um, come in to the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus, and so these are from like the carotid artery to um, regulate blood pressure and changes in response to elevated pulse and high blood pressure. And uh, we'll come back to that later. Now, in terms of the sympathetics here, the central nervous system uh, neurons here are located in the mainly the thoracic cord from T1 down to about L3. Okay, and so... These also go through a ganglion, which is acetylcholine nicotinic 2 receptor. And so again, these are not the nicotinic receptors on muscle. They're not affected by myasthenia gravis. And so in general, the nicotinic, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the sympathetic system uses norepinephrine on alpha and beta adrenergic receptors. Okay, from the uh, adrenal medulla, of course, this would be more epinephrine than norepinephrine. But the one exception here, definitely worthwhile knowing, is that sweat glands, although they are activated by the sympathetic system, it's via acetylcholine on muscarinic receptors. And so when we have something that does, you know, impact release of acetylcholine, we could have some understimulation of sweat glands and uh, dry skin. All right, so just to sort of uh, lock this down, when we have medications that have anticholinergic properties like tricyclic antidepressants, so nortriptyline, amitriptyline, or atropine, then you block the uh, muscarinic receptors here um, as part of the parasympathetic system, and so that could definitely affect the pupil. Um, so maybe a, the pupil dilates a little bit, patient complains of blurred vision, uh, most common side effect of these medications are blocking the salivary glands. So dry mouth is very common. You block the vagus nerve, then most often that will cause uh, constipation. And again, you block acetylcholine here, stimulation of the detrusor muscle on the bladder, and so we could have some urinary retention. And so these are, would be common side effects of anticholinergic medications. All right, finally, um, organophosphate exposure. So, of course, if you see a vignette and, um, you know, there's a farmer uh, coming in, you should be primed for that. And so, um, and just another look here at the neuromuscular junction. Here's acetylcholinesterase. So, here's acetylcholine stimulating nicotinic receptors with depolarization of motor end plate. 
but then it's broken down by acetylcholine esterase into choline and acetate. Choline gets taken back up where it's repackaged or formed into acetylcholine again and put back into the synaptic vesicles. But if you give, or if the patient is exposed to organophosphates, we have irreversible inhibition of acetylcholine esterase. And again, because that is um, the whole key to breaking down acetylcholine, it's inactivated not by reuptake, but mainly by the enzyme, we have much more acetylcholine, uh, acetylcholine um, available. And so if we have excessive, then muscarinic stimulation... Um, just think of that anatomy we just looked at. Well, we're going to excessively stimulate vagus nerve on the GI tract, so we're going to have diarrhea, um, urination, nausea, and vomiting. Uh, remember that uh, the salivary glands here are parasympathetic, so if we excessively stimulate those, we're going to get salivation. Um, the sweat glands are stimulated by acetylcholine muscarinic, so the patient will be sweating. And... Um, Certainly excessive acetylcholine, estray, acetylcholine stimulation in the heart. We would expect to result in bradycardia. But um, when you bombard muscarinic receptors, you can occasionally get this kind of alternating um, tachycardia and bradycardia. But in terms of the anatomy, you know, you certainly would anticipate mainly bradycardia. But this can be unstable, and so this can kind of fluctuate. So uh, dumbbells is kind of the way to remember the uh, effects on muscarinic receptors. So it's defecation, urination, meiosis okay, on the pupils. The B I put in large here because it's uh, on the lungs, bronchorrhea and bronchospasm, and on the heart, bradycardia. Again, not always, but classically. Um, uh, emesis, lacrimation, so the patient's tearing, and salivation. Now, in terms of the central nervous system, acetylcholine is one of the most important um, neurotransmitters, uh, the most important, actually, for memory pathways. And so if we have overstimulation of acetylcholine, you don't get super smart, but it tends to inactivate some of these pathways. So patients become confused, often will have um, um, anxiety sort of along with that. And if it's a really um, profound exposure, patients may even merge into a coma and have some seizures. Now, if you have too much acetylcholine and you excessively stimulate nicotinic receptors, that doesn't make you super strong. You eventually inactivate those nicotinic receptors. And so usually more than 12 hours after exposure, patients begin to experience diffuse weakness. And most significantly, the neuromuscular junctions involved in breathing are affected. So some patients may need to go on a ventilator because of respiratory weakness. So patients, um, if you can prevent that respiratory failure, um, these patients do well and have a good recovery. All right, and boards will sometimes um, ask a question about, you know, if you're taking care of someone that's suspected of having an organophosphate exposure, you need to take adequate protection. Um, so uh, wear gloves and other protective gear because there have been cases of a secondary um, exposure where uh, clinicians can experience some of the effects of um, organophosphate exposure.